Good morning and welcome to Worthing Baptist Church. It's the second Sunday in Advent and this morning we're going to focus on peace. And our prayer is that that peace of God that transcends all understanding is something that touches you and grows in you this morning. Great if you're watching on Facebook to do an emoji to let us know you're there, let others know you're there, to say hi, to type out hi, and maybe even to send a photo of where you're watching from. And again, that's all about mutual encouragement and a sense of being community together, although in a different way to that which we're used to. You can do that on YouTube as well, make comments if you like. Please, if you didn't join us on Facebook Live last Sunday after the service, then you to do that, you need to join the Facebook Live group and most of you know how to do that. Maybe some haven't got around to doing that yet. Those who did last week from the feedback, people enjoyed that as well. And it gets you, gives you the opportunity to post questions and make comments and then for Peter and I to reflect on them a little bit. So that will start 10 minutes after this service ends. May the peace of God that transcends all understanding protect your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus this morning and beyond. The Supremacy of the Son of God The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to him all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Thanks be to God. Oh, 
The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom, and his reign would bring shalom with no end. A time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Erene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the Apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace.
As we come to our offering this week, the words of Jesus, blessed are the peacemakers, comes to mind. And as we know his peace more and more, we pray that we are part of him taking his peace to those we meet. So let's lift up our, our money, let's lift, lift up our giving, let's lift up ourselves, the whole of who we are, and who we are individually and together, and pray. Lord of all, we pray for all who are searching for peace in their lives, those burdened with anxiety, either about themselves or their loved ones, facing difficulties and problems to which they can see no solutions. God of peace, reach out and still the storm. We pray for those wrestling with inner fears and phobias, torn apart by emotional and psychological pressures. God of peace, reach out and still the storm. We pray for those living amongst change and upheaval, especially all who are threatened by violence and warfare and are struggling with this pandemic. God of peace, reach out and still the storm. To all those in chaos and turmoil, all who are restless and troubled, grant your calm, your tranquility, your quietness and your peace, which causes us to know that peace that transcends all understanding. God of peace, reach out and still the storm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 7. The Prince of Peace is born. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honour Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. There was a particular image from this morning's video that really stood out to me. It's the image of a stone wall, whole and complete with no gaps or missing bricks. As we heard in the Old Testament, such a wall could be called shalom, the Hebrew word for peace. Early each morning, I walk Frisbee and we go past many garden walls. Some are new, some are old, some have been recently repaired and some look set to crumble. One wall on our walk has this extraordinary metre long diagonal crack. It reminds me of what they used to say on Grand Designs about cracks in old buildings. You only need to worry about it if you can fit your hand in it. And I could fit my hand in this one. Such a wall lacks shalom, peace. Behind these garden walls are front gardens. And behind these front gardens are front doors. And behind these front doors are people. And I wonder if these people know shalom, wholeness, peace in life, peace in their relationships. When I was a teenager, a few friends and I would spend many a winter night walking around the streets of Durrington, praying for the residents who lived there, unbeknown to them. We'd marked out on a map every street in a half a kilometre radius of New Life Church, and each Monday we'd slowly walk and quietly pray through these streets. We had no idea who was behind the, those garden walls, those front gardens, those front doors, but in our youthful enthusiasm, we'd 
pray these big prayers for the people there. We pray that they would discover God's love for them and that they would know healing in the widest sense. We'd pray for their physical health, mental health, spiritual health, relational health. We'd ask God to meet their needs, to restore what was broken in their lives and awaken them to his grace. And looking back now, I see that what we were praying for was shalom, peace, wholeness. One key aspect of this shalom peace is restored relationship or renewed relationship or right relationship. The author and therapist Esther Perel says the quality of your life ultimately depends on the quality of your relationships. I'll repeat that. The quality of your life ultimately depends on the quality of your relationships. I wonder if you'd agree with that. How are your relationships how are you and God? Are you enjoying that relationship? How are you and that family member that comes to mind? How are you and that friend that comes to mind? How are you with yourself? What does your inner voice sound like? Harsh and critical or warm and compassionate? Do you treat your God-given body well? How are you and the rest of creation? Does your way of life violate or guard the, the balance and integrity of the planet? Do you care about animals and their quality of life? All of this relates to shalom, peace. And please don't, don't rush to think about what you might do differently. Just imagine that you're surveying the wall that is your life, touching the brick or stone, feeling the joints or gaps, gently noticing the condition without judgment. Imagine a wall that represented the United Kingdom or a wall that represented the whole world. What gaps and cracks might we find there? How are the relationships between rich and poor? How are the relationships between white people and people of colour? How are the relationships between non-disabled people and disabled people? How are the relationships between heterosexual cisgender people and the LGBT community? Where do you long for peace? The peace that brings wholeness and restoration to relationships. Again, don't, don't rush to think of what part you might play in helping to bring about that wholeness. Relax. This is Advent. This is a time of waiting, preparation, expectation. In Isaiah chapter 9, there is a prophetic poem. And normally, a prophet like Isaiah speaks for God. But here we find something like a song of thanksgiving addressed to God. In the background of this poem is a terrible war. The people of Judah had lost 120,000 troops in a single day. But now that the war has come to an end, God is being thanked for establishing peace. Isaiah describes it as a great light dawning on people who formerly lived in the land of deep darkness. God is praised for increasing their joy like at harvest time. God is praised for breaking the yoke that burdened them and the rod of their oppressor. God is praised for every warrior's boot and every blood-soaked garment could be burned in the fire now that the war has ended. And then this song of thanksgiving takes an interesting turn from boots being burned in the fire to the birth of a baby Messiah. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. These words tell of a royal birth. And some commentators suggest that these words were referring to the birth of Hezekiah, who grew up to be a great king of Judah. But these royal titles, likely borrowed from the Egyptians, witness to a divine prince of peace, whose reign, unlike Hezekiah's, would last forever. 
No doubt the birth of Hezekiah would have filled the people with hope. And if he grew to be a righteous king, they could expect a reign of peace and justice. But these royal titles were too big for Hezekiah and too big for his son and his son and his son. They did not reign forever. You can read about it in the Bible. None of them could be called mighty God. These words in Isaiah chapter 9 point beyond all these kings to another baby. From our vantage point, we are able to see in these words the promise of Jesus, a baby whose arrival could be described as a great light that dawns on people walking in darkness. But Jesus grew up to be an unusual kind of king. Unlike a typical warrior king who establishes peace through conquering rival nations, this Jesus was dressed up as a mock king with a crown of thorns and crucified by the empire. And unlike a typical king whose body decays in a tomb like Hezekiah's did, Jesus is raised to life and given all authority on heaven, uh, in heaven and on earth. And in his authoritative name, vertical peace is proclaimed between God and humanity. And horizontal peace is proclaimed between groups of people divided by hostility. To the Romans, the Apostle Paul writes, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And to the Ephesians, he writes, his, Jesus' purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. The title Prince of Peace could not be more fitting. God in Christ makes peace with us. God in Christ restores wholeness and God in Christ invites us to join him in repairing our cracked and chipped walls of this world that fall short of shalom. But we must slow down and pay attention to how God goes about making peace if we want to share in his distinctive work or it, that he's doing in the world. Because he didn't come in strength, he didn't come in power, he didn't come with riches, he didn't come with armour. He came in weakness, powerlessness, poverty and vulnerability. He was an embryo in a young woman's womb and from that minuscule embryo he grew in the darkness. We cannot despise the small, the weak, the hidden. After all, this is what we are too. The French theologian Jacques Ellul wrote that Jesus told his disciples that they were a little flock. All his comparisons tend to show that the disciples will necessarily be small in number and weak. The, the leaven in the dough, the salt in the soup, the sheep among wolves and many other metaphors. Jesus does not seem to have had a vision of a triumphant and triumphal church encircling the globe. He always depicts for us a secret force that modifies things from within, that acts spiritually, that shows us community unable to be anything else but community. The kingdom of heaven is the little grain, the seed buried in the soil, the treasure hidden in a field. If, as God's kingdom, it is called upon to encircle the whole globe, this is not its present role, nor that of the church on earth. End quote. For much of the last 2,000 years, Christianity has merged with and been corrupted by political and social power. This is what Elul means by a triumphal church encircling the globe. In the past, Christianity tried to use power as a shortcut to shalom and it backfired and undermined the central message that it is in human weakness and smallness that we behold the power of God. And this relationship between human and divine is exemplified in the embryo who was to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And that's good news for us because God hasn't stopped working through the small. Like grains of salt preserving and seasoning meat, we are called to preserve and season God's creation through our smallness, not despite our smallness, through our smallness. And this is the opposite of what we're accustomed to in our world. Big states upping their military spending in order to safeguard global peace by staying ahead. And whatever you think of that strategy, the reality is peace is made and secured each day by ordinary people, small people like you and me. People who serve, people who pray, people who forgive, people who reach out, people who take risks, people who model a healthy vulnerability, people who say sorry, 
People who don't cling to their privilege. People who humble themselves. People who listen. People who exercise gentleness. People who help enemies talk. People who let enemies talk through them. People who bridge the gap. People who care for the children that are caught in the crossfire of a dispute. People who seek reconciliation. People who seek justice. People who seek reparation. People who don't just push their rights, but also recognise their responsibilities. People who acknowledge that we are all connected. People who see the image of God in the other. And none of this stuff is glamorous. Most of it's small, most of it goes unnoticed, but it's the work of God. To use the wall metaphor again, it's as if the broken walls of our world are being repaired in secret, just like the embryo that grows in the secret place of Mary's womb. This is how God works. This is how Shalom grows, in the small, in the weak, in the hidden. Two questions for you as I come to close. Firstly, given that Jesus came to make peace between you and God, neighbour, and indeed the whole of creation, will you turn to God, neighbour, and the whole of creation in love this morning, renouncing the hostility that divides and has been defeated at the cross? And secondly, will you call the Prince of Peace Lord and follow in his ways of peace, recognising that we usually behold God's peacemaking power in the small, the weak and the hidden? Will you? Like every Sunday, the invitation is to come to God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, to be open to his healing grace, to receive the love of God poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit and to recommit to Jesus wherever he happens to be working for peace in the small, in the weak and in the hidden. Amen.
we come to the blessing, that reminder that in about 10 minutes time, we're going to go live, Facebook Live, on our group, the After Service Q&A. And so give you time, that 10 minutes, to grab yourself a coffee or a tea, and then come back and settle down and join into that. And please, from the beginning, from the, from the get-go, uh, make your comments, ask your questions, and we will try to reflect on them as openly and as honestly as we can. But in the meantime, and over the days ahead, and over Advent and into the new year, may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. And may he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Thank you.